Okay. <clears throat> it's going to be pretty hard to follow that. Um, I don't have anything particularly scary or particularly technical for you today. I thought I would talk about some concepts, and I thought I would talk about some things that scare me a, a, a fair amount. I have a hidden agenda in giving this talk, and it's not very well hidden. You're going you're to see what it is as, as I go along. Um, what I wanted to do is explain to you why the concept of cyber war is bullshit, but I want to also explain why you are going to wind up having to deal with cyber war whether you want to or not, unless you are a citizen of a superpower. But we'll get to that. Anyway, so <clears throat> there's a couple of different things that are going on with cyber whatever you want to call it. And the media and a lot of security professionals wind up conflating these different things into sort of one bucket. I saw a, um, uh, a note go across on the uh, SANS news bites uh, uh, ye uh, yesterday morning, actually, um, in which uh, somebody was referring to uh, some ordinary industrial espionage as a cyber attack. Um, very interesting. But is espionage really an attack and so forth? And we're going to explore that a little bit. Crime, terror, and warfare are three completely different things. As we've seen um, uh, in the last five years or so, uh, there's a huge difference between a war and uh, terror attacks. And of course, there's another huge difference between criminal activity and terrorism or, uh, or uh, military activity. And then what I'm going to try to do is define a few of these topics so that you can see the differences between uh, cyber crime versus cyber espionage and so forth. So excuse me if I'm, I'm going to be a little bit academic here. It's kind, of, it's kind of how I roll. OK, so what is a cyber criminal trying to do? Um, the agenda of a cyber criminal is purely for profit. This is totally different from any of the other cyber whatevers that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of minutes. As a result of the fact that they're profit driven, they're inher inherently going to be diffuse and non-ideological. Right? Their ideology, if they have one, is money. Money is a very simple ideology to understand, but like most important ideologies, it's very difficult to, uh, to eradicate. It would be very, very hard to stomp out people's love of making a quick buck without doing any work for it. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly love that idea myself. It's just a question whether or not you want to go there. But the cyber criminal, because they're profit driven and because there is no kind of central nexus of cyber crime, there's no Lex Luthor of cyberspace. Uh, at this point, although maybe somebody would like to try to do that, um, they're going to be impossible to deal with. That's the short form, right? Because essentially, cybercrime result, it's a smash and grab. It's a hit and run. All they have to do is come in there, and if you can steal a penny from a, a million people, you've, you've made a pretty significant amount of money in your, in your day's work. Um, we can't eradicate them, because as long as there are humans who are going to be happy to make a quick buck without doing any work, there's going to be a new cyber criminal coming along. And in fact, as we continue to see that there are plenty of business opportunities for monetizing cyber crime, we're going to have more and more cyber crime as the time goes on. I think that's a pretty, pretty safe uh, bet. The other thing that's very interesting about cyber criminals is they're quite creative. Because their profit motive, their, their motive is purely profit, um, they are extremely aware of the first mover advantage. The first cyber criminal who comes up with a new way of stealing money from a lot of people is going to make the money. The rest are going to be the also wannabes, right? They're going to be the, like the, the, the I don't know about you, but it's been a while since I fell for a Nigerian for a war scam. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so they're going to rapidly shift around to where the money is. There's a tendency to follow the herd. There's all kinds of fascinating dynamics in cyber criminals. But if you think for a second, the, dynamic, the dynamics of being a cyber criminal are completely different from the, the, the guys that we're going to talk about next. Okay, so the next guys are the cyber terrorists. Now, there's some interesting questions in my mind as to whether there's actually any real cyber terror going on around there. There's, there's maybe some stuff, but um, the term cyber terrorist is still thrown around a fair bit in the industry, but usually when you see someone talking about a cyber terror incident, they're talking about something like you know, the government agency that got five billion emails and their mail server collapsed, Ooh. you know, or something ridiculous like that. Um, the picture that we get in our minds when we talk about cyber terror is, you know, some guy whose eyes burn with ideological fervor, clicking on a mouse in a nuclear reactor someplace melts down. That's, that's the, the picture that people want to sell us. 
the reality of the, the cyber terrorist is, is you know, the, the annoyed kid who DDoSes somebody who, who uh, screwed up his tax return or something like that. Um, the agenda of a cyber terrorist, though, is, at least in theory, purely ideological. Now, it's, it's, it's actually, there's, there's some very interesting social questions about, about the ideological relationship between terrorists and, and, and their alleged beliefs, but, but that's another entire topic we're, we're not going to get into here. But the objective is to do some kind of maximum damage public attack with no restraint. And in fact, the, 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 the agenda of the terrorist to show no restraint against innocent victims is an increase in the, the kind of the fear factor of the whole thing. The most successful terrorist is the one who is the most unrestrained in lashing out and doing the most damage as obviously and as publicly as possible. Now, if you think about that, that places the cyber terrorist and the cyber criminal exactly at odds with each other. The cyber criminal wants to clickjack you. The cyber terrorist wants your browser to explode in your face and burn your face off. Um, so the threat, though, for cyber terrorists is, is similar to the threat for cyber criminals. It's a little, little bit of a different agenda, but their target is going to be civilian infrastructure. But specifically, if you're going to attempt to do acts of terrorism, you want things that are going to explode. Things that explode or burn are, are kind of the top of the list, and then it works its way down from there. Things that are toxic is kind of almost as good. But it explode, burn, toxic, or radiate, yeah, sure. And then you get down to the ATM networks don't work, and then you get down to World of Warcraft is unavailable for a couple of days, and some geek someplace hangs himself, but that's it. Okay, now that's not particularly scary, except for that one guy who's got no life. Um, okay, now. The thing that I find so fascinating is, is this, what I call the cyber terror paradox. There's huge room for potential growth in cyber terror. Whenever I am with a bunch of security practitioners, we're sitting around drinking beer and getting depressed and talking about computer security. We all do the, you know, geez, if I was a cyber terrorist, man, I'd put a hurting on those guys. And it's fascinating because you can get a bunch of security practitioners to sit around and think for about 15 minutes and they can come up with some really scary scenarios and they're, it's generally scarily practical, and I've come up with my share of them as well. So here's the question. Why hasn't it happened yet? If a bunch of smart guys at a conference can think of 50 or 60 plausible scenarios for cyber terror, why haven't the terrorists thought of this yet? Or why haven't they effectuated any of these ideas? I don't know. It's a fascinating question. Maybe it's simply that the, quote, real terrorists, end quote, have just not gotten around to recruiting IT professionals. It, it could just be that simple. It could be that we're looking at a gigantic iceberg you know, scenario of cyber terror looming down the road. Or there's, there's something else, and I don't know what, the, I don't know what, what that would be. Uh, in fact, if any of you have got any suggestions for why you think this hasn't been happening, I'd love to hear about it. Because you know, I don't know about you, but if, you, if I was a terrorist and I had a couple hundred thousand dollars in funding to do awful things. I could cost pretty much any government you wanted to name a couple billion dollars fairly quickly. So you know, it's interesting, right? Why is this not happening? Now, the second part of the cyber terror paradox is that the most technologically sophisticated countries are the most likely to be the good targets, which is interesting because they're also the ones that are most likely to successfully weather those kinds of attacks, presumably, right? But what's interesting is that the high-tech countries are the ones that are easiest to hurt with low-tech attacks, usually because depending so much on high-tech appears to make you lazy and stupid. Um, at least that, that's what it looks like to me, right? If you look at the uh, United States intelligence community, which has become over-reliant on satellite intelligence instead of human intelligence, they basically sat there and went, uh, got no idea what's going on in the world because we can't see it on our satellites, right? Being over-reliant on technology allows you to get lazy and stupid and makes you a much better target for low-tech attacks. So actually, this may be the answer to my first question. Right? It could be that the reason that there aren't cyber terrorists out there is because the targets that are interesting to attack with cyber terror aren't going to get real excited about it, again, except for the, the few people who'd panic if World of Warcraft went down. Um, <clears throat> now, the next one is the cyber spy. And then we'll start talking about cyber war. I've got, to, I've got to set this all up for you first. Now, the agenda of a spy is, again, completely different from a criminal or a, uh, a terrorist. Terrorists want to be splashy. 
Criminals want to be profitable. Spies want to be covert. Right? It is only in the movie that you run into spies who go around actually letting people know that they're spies. Real spies, real intelligence officers, usually are completely boring, uninteresting looking people who just collect information and correlate it. The agenda of a spy is to surreptitiously gather secrets from a target. In fact, the agenda of a cyber spy and a cyber terrorist, just like with a cyber criminal, are completely opposed. The cyber criminal opposes the cyber, uh, the, the cyber spy's agenda as well, because what a cyber criminal is doing is just muddying the water. The cyber spy wants to get into your company or your, or your government agency, get his feelers into the right places so that he's got you know, perfect intelligence collection capability over your network and all of your information systems, and then sit there and do that with a minimum amount of work. Having to worry about the cyber, the, the, uh, the cyber criminal who causes you to have to update your Windows configuration all the time, that guy is really annoying because there's a chance that you're going to stumble over the espionage activity, or worse yet, disable the guy's in, uh, espionage uh, intelligence collecting capability. Wouldn't that really suck if you had spent months and months penetrating some government agency, and then Microsoft pushes out a patch that disables your, your penetration tools? Whoops. Right? You went blind at the wrong time. This would be terrible. So the purpose of a spy is to be surreptitious. And the, historically, the primary way of doing that is just normal human intelligence subornment, right? The way to penetrate a network, if you're a cyber spy, is not to launch some kind of funky clickjacking worm or whatever. The way to do it is to own the guy who takes the backup tapes home from the knock, right? That's the way to do it. And historically, that has been how real espionage has worked in any media involving, uh, you know, any, any media involving electronics or computing. Um, I could point to you know, the Walker spy family and uh, Hanson and Alder James, right? Alder James did not do, uh, Alder James was the KGB mole who basically sold all of the counterintelligence activity to the CIA for about $450,000. Uh, he mooted billions of dollars worth of work, um, and the way he did it was by carrying out a couple of floppy disks every so often, right? This was not high tech. This was just a low-placed idiot who was willing to sell his country out for not a tremendous amount of money, uh, and he did it with floppies. Okay, so the cyber era, the, the modern era, era of computing, simplifies some of the aspects of, of, of intelligence, right? So now if I was Alder James, I don't need to make 75 floppies to carry out all of the data. I can carry it all out on one thumb drive, um, or I can carry it out on my iPod or something like that. Ooh, that's really fascinating. But, Basically, it really hasn't changed things a whole lot. Okay, now let's talk about cyber warriors. And now I'd like to show you why I think cyber war is bullshit. So the idea of a cyber warrior is that you're prepared for military purposes to attack, degrade, penetrate, whatever, enemy command and control systems as an adjunct to some kind of physical military operations. Right? And the reason I say that, I had to spend a lot, believe me, I spent a lot of time crafting that sentence because it's got to be an adjunct to physical military operations. There's absolutely no point whatsoever for a country to go, you know, <clears throat> it's Monday, let's launch a cyber attack on, uh, I'm going to pick a country, uh, Liechtenstein. Right? The U.S. is going to launch a cyber attack on Liechtenstein, we're going to crush them electronically because it's Monday. That doesn't happen. Right? You only crush Liechtenstein electronics, electronically if you're planning on invading them or something like that. We'll get to that in a second. So what's the threat here? Well, <clears throat> there are at least five huge paradoxes that make cyber war bullshit. And I'm going to kind of run through them in order. And maybe there, I'm sure there are more. These are five that I was able to think of during the course of a couple of years of thinking about this problem. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying military stuff ever since I was in high school. I was fascinated in the, the uh, doctrines of uh, nuclear war and mature, uh, mutual assured destruction. I've spent a lot of time reading military theorists. That's my only qualifications in this field. So I would think that if somebody is a real military thinker or puts any real thought into this or deeper thought than I have, they would be able to find other, probably even more severe flaws with the notion of cyber war. But this is just what I was able to come up with should, should tell you something. So let's just go through these in, in, in some kind of order. So the first one is what I call the disarmament effect. Okay, so 